Uh, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the latest event for the Harrison Memorial Lecture Series on the Sojourner Truth Organization. We have a new book uh, called Truth and Revolution, and Michael Stadamar, I believe, yep. he's okay. going to talk to us about it, and there will be time for questions, and books are on sale in the back. So let's give him a round of applause. Hi, everybody. Thanks for coming. Um, First, I wanted to say that it is uh, sort of personally exciting to be the Howard Zinn Memorial Lecture Series because I now think of myself as a historian, and that trajectory I think probably began in some ways when my brother gave me one of the like first editions of People's History in like 1986 or something like that. And read it and loved it, and I've, I've shifted in a lot of ways obviously since then, but um, it's still sort of an important moment in my life. <laughs> Uh, I wanted to start today, first of all, by, uh, on a, I guess, a slightly somber note. One thing that was a sort of repeated aspect of my experience of working on this book uh, from 2005 until this year is that a number of people that were either important to my research or important to STO or important to me personally have passed away. Uh, and there's too many to really list, but I did want to sort of mention three of them specifically. Um, one is my mom, who passed away two and a half years ago, and the book is dedicated to her. Uh, the second one thank you, is um, a woman named Dara Greenwald, who is, was a sort of cultural production artist, radical, amazing person, uh, and was the partner of my friend Josh McPhee, who did the design for the cover, um, who passed away this winter. And the third one is a guy that some people in this room, I think, are familiar with, Joel Olson. Um, who passed away this spring, who was a guy that I had known since the 1990s and was very important in sort of passing along the legacy of the Social and Truth Organization, of which neither he nor I was ever a member, but um, that he was part of that process. Uh, so um, I can tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, I'm 39 years old. I was radicalized as a teenager, started calling myself an anarchist in the mid to late 80s. Um, I, uh, the sort of first Gulf War in 1991 and the Rodney King riots in 92 were kind of pivotal moments for me as a younger person. Um, I am still an anarchist. Uh, as an anarchist over the years, I would say the bulk of my political activity has been focused in some way around the opposition to white supremacy, uh, often either in an anti-imperialist or an anti-fascist mode, if you will. Um, I am a fairly new member of a fairly new and, and small uh, group called the First of May Anarchist Alliance. Um, I am also a husband and father of two young kids, one of whom is off in that corner of the plan. Um, he's my executive assistant on my little book tour. Uh, and as I said, the book was about seven years in the making, from 2005 uh, until now, and it was literally just uh, arrived back from the printers about a week and a half ago. Um, so this may be its first arrival in Boston, I believe. Um, and after about 15 years as uh, somebody out in the working world, I uh, returned to the academy and last fall started a PhD program in US history. So the STO book was uh, prior to all of that, um, but in some ways kind of led me to decide that I did want to go back and, um, and study history. So what I'm going to do tonight, uh, I recognize that I'm here as part of a lecture series. I have less of a lecture and more of a reading, and I'd like to engage in some kind of dialogue after that reading. So I'll tell you uh, first a little bit of background about the Sojourner Truth Organization. Um, and then I have three readings that I'm going to do, uh, the first of which draws from the introduction to the book uh, and talks about the sort of ambitions of the book, and also from the opening vignette of one of the first kind of meaty chapters that talks about STO's workplace organizing activities um, in the early 1970s. Second reading is going to be focused on uh, kind of theoretical debate inside STO in the early to mid 70s around the concept of white skin privilege, which was, uh, as probably everybody knows, was central to STO's political trajectory. I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, 
And that contradiction, the way I've been phrasing it, is that it was a contradiction that pitted concepts of communism, and I mean that with a small c, not a, not a sort of capital C um, uh, communism, and the concept of autonomy on the other side of that, um, that set of contradictory concepts. Uh, and I'll, I'll try to unpack that a little bit more as I go through the readings. And then the third reading will be from the conclusion, which is about the legacy of STO in the present moment. Um, and that reading will focus specifically on questions of uh, sort of mass activity and legality and illegality that I think are especially timely in a sort of post-Occupy world. Um, so a little bit about the Sojourn Truth Organization. It was a small revolutionary group that was founded in Chicago in 1969, uh, at the very end of 1969, and existed in one form or another until sometime around 1986 or so. Um, it was named for a woman named Sojourner Truth, who is probably familiar to everybody, but just in case, she was a former slave uh, and a radical feminist of the 19th century who advocated uh, both against white supremacy and against patriarchy. Um, the group was largely based in Chicago pretty much throughout its, ex its existence, but after about 1974, it had members in a variety of places from coast to coast at different points in time. Uh, the group always identified itself as a Leninist organization, but what it meant by that, as we'll sort of discuss in some of these readings, was in a lot of ways profoundly different from what just about any other group of Leninists meant by that term then or now. Um, they uh, focused heavily in terms of theory on a couple of key concepts. Uh, one of those concepts is class consciousness and a specific idea that STO developed that they call dual consciousness. It doesn't come up much in the readings that I'm going to do tonight, but I'm happy to talk about it in the uh, discussion period. Um, second one is a heavy emphasis on white supremacy and the concept of white skin privilege. Uh, and the third is the concept of autonomy, which was a kind of large and unwieldy thing in the same way that it is for a lot of people on the left today. Um, and I will again try to unpack a little bit of what STO meant by autonomy as a concept uh, in the course of these readings. Um, and then the fourth kind of key theoretical notion was what STO described as the rejection of bourgeois legality as a framework for political action. So that was in some ways a theoretical insight, but in many ways was a sort of pivot over to um, strategy and action. And in terms of strategy and action, STO's uh, areas of work were many and varied over the course of its existence in ways that some people criticized as being eclectic. Um, I think uh, it provides an interesting way to view the broader trajectory of the revolutionary left over a longer period of time because STO was actively involved in so many different things. But key ones among those many areas of work included uh, a lot of factory organizing in the early 1970s, uh, an active period of anti-imperialist solidarity in the later 1970s, especially around the Puerto Rican independence movement, but also in solidarity with uh, Iranian radicals active against the Shah prior to the 1979 revolution, um, and a lot of solidarity with um, revolutionary black nationalist groupings as well during that period. Um, and then uh, the other sort of major area in its later years was a lot of emphasis placed on active engagement with uh, new social movements. So that was everything from anti-nuclear struggles to anti-fascist efforts, some youth and student organizing, uh, a lot of feminist, um, uh, especially reproductive rights activity, uh, a whole range of, of things sort of fell into that category in the later years of STO's existence. Um, a phrase that I often go back to, and I think this comes out in the, in the very first reading, um, is to say that STO was both uh, exceptional and exemplary in its context. Um, and I'll get into a little bit more of what I mean by that in the very first reading. So, the first reading is from, again, is sort of cobbled together from two spots. So this is the last couple of paragraphs of the introduction, and then the first few pages of the second chapter. Um, this book covers a lot of terrain. It describes events that took place during three different decades in locations all over the world, from Chicago, New York, and Kansas City, to Puerto Rico, Italy, and Iran. 
While focusing on the specific trajectory of a single small organization, it attempts to shed light on the broader history of the international revolutionary left over the last half century. STO was both exemplary and exceptional when considered in the context of the movements that emerged from the end of the 1960s. It grappled with a set of problems that were nearly universal, the contradictions of race and class, the failure of revolutionary struggles to establish or maintain free and egalitarian societies, the need to incorporate the work of conscious revolutionaries in mass struggles, and so forth. Yet, its proposals for dealing with these problems were proudly unorthodox, drawing on a range of sources in the Marxist, revolutionary nationalist, feminist, and other radical traditions. While claiming the mantle of Leninism, STO diverged sharply from most standard interpretations of that term. In the pages that follow, I attempt to balance an intellectual history of STO's theoretical innovations with a social history of the group's real-world activities. This task is, of course, more easily identified than accomplished, in part because the available written materials, both published and internal, tend to focus on theory at the expense of practice. Oral history interviews that I conducted with numerous former members only partially redressed this imbalance. But for me, as for STO, it remains a fundamental premise that ideas can only obtain their value and indeed their validation in the messy world in which we actually live. As a result, in addition to discussions of consciousness and white supremacy and autonomy, these pages include stories of getting, keeping, and losing jobs, reflections on popular music and spectator sports, descriptions of protests and conferences, and commentary on organizational questions that may, on first glance, seem needlessly obscure. The goal is not to be eclectic, but to be true to the complex life of any revolutionary group. Considered as a whole, the historical arc of the Sojourner Truth organization has much to teach contemporary radicals, especially those aspiring to be revolutionaries who try to think as well as to act. This book is intended as a modest contribution to the creation of a framework for moving forward by looking closely at a small slice of the past. And then from the beginning of chapter two. In the fall of 1973, a six day long wildcat strike took place at the Western Electric Hawthorne Works in the Chicago suburb of Cicero, Illinois. About 150 men, mainly black and Latino, refused to work in the twister department of the cable plant where telephone cables were wound together by machine. Although the strikers were officially members of the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, or IBEW, they viewed the union with total disdain because of its cozy relationship with the company. When the company laid off several employees and told the remaining workers that they would need to pick up the slack, union officials counseled the men to accept the changes while their complaints were investigated. No doubt thinking of the many accidents caused by previous management speedups, the workers instead decided to shut down the, the department and walk out. The strikers organized themselves well, and in addition to demanding a reduction in the workload back to its previous level, the removal of a racist foreman, the creation of a rest area near their department, and access to better medical facilities, they also demanded a permanent negotiating committee for the department, elected by the workers to deal directly with the company when grievances arose thus bypassing the union altogether. The men elected a temporary negotiating committee made up of one black and one Latino worker from each shift, and they immediately established a picket line to raise plant-wide awareness of their actions. The company was willing to meet with the negotiating committee, but no concessions were forthcoming, and the workers were told to return to work by the following week or be fired en masse. IBEW officials told the workers their strike was illegal and that no aid would come from the union if the walkout didn't end by the company's stated deadline. A total of 26,000 workers were employed at the massive facility, and in living memory, there had never been any sort of organized work stoppage at the plant, whether authorized or wildcat. Given the minuscule numbers in the Twister department, the strike was hardly major news to the outside world. For much of Chicago's left, however, the implications were significant. The walkout was seen as more evidence of the growing militancy of workers in heavy industry and as a prime opportunity to distribute radical literature and potentially recruit new members. But there was a problem. 
the strikers weren't interested. As one worker explained, quote, we don't want any communists, socialists, movies, raps, leaflets, newspapers, newspaper interviews, photographs, lectures, or anything else, end quote. Most Marxist organizations viewed this sort of rejection as a kind of working class anti-communism and abandoned the struggle in frustration. One of the only left groups that established ongoing communication with the strikers was the Sojourner Truth Organization, which had been observing the Hawthorne works since at least May 1971. That month, the first issue of The Insurgent Worker, which was STO's agitational newspaper for a number of years in the early 70s, focused heavily on problems there. And in an editorial provocatively boldly entitled Western Electric, We Shall Bury You, opined that, quote, if there is any crime against the working people for which Western Electric can escape responsibility, we have not been able to discover it." End quote. Two years later, when the Twister Department workers asked the Labor Committee of the Chicago branch of the National Lawyers Guild, or NLG, for advice on the legality of the strike, several STO members on the committee were able to establish contact with the strikers. The men accepted both legal assistance and an offer to print leaflets on STO's press. According to one STO member, quote, in this situation, one in which we had no direct influence, we felt the best we could do was to ready ourselves to help execute the, any plans the workers would come up with, putting our full resources and ideas at their disposal if they desired, end quote. 10,000 leaflets written by the strikers and printed by STO were distributed to other workers at the plant. And having received some key legal advice from the NLG Labor Committee, the men found themselves negotiating from a position of strength. After six days, and with the pressure building, the company management agreed to every one of the workers' demands. But in exchange, they required that the men stop discussing the situation with their co-workers. Unfortunately, this code of silence proved to be the undoing of the strike gains as the company proceeded to transfer the most militant workers, including the original members of the Permanent Negotiating Committee, to other departments, and otherwise disrupt the momentum gained from the immediate victory. Having deliberately accepted the limits the men placed on outside involvement in the strike, STO could only stand by and watch this final act play out. Despite its assessment that broad solidarity efforts, both within the factory and outside it, were the only chance for long-term success in the plant. There are literally hundreds of stories, much like this one, describing various workplace interventions made by the Sojourner Truth Organization during the early 1970s. In this case, the course of events reflects both what STO had in common with other groups, an emphasis on organizing at the point of production, and what made the group unique, an intense commitment to the autonomy of workers in struggle. And at that point, the chapter goes on to describe some of those other inst instances and also a number of the sort of theoretical and strategic arguments that went into that process. Um, the second reading shifts, if you will, from practice to theory. Uh, so in, in the first reading, I think, especially in that vignette, you can get a sense of what I was describing before as the kind of contradiction between communism and autonomy as it played out in STO, and in this instance, Autonomy clearly won the day as far as STO's decision making was concerned, um, and the group sort of went along with supporting uh, this uh, insurgency of workers um, despite serious political reservations um, about the, the structure of the, of the workers' project. The second reading focuses more internally on a set of debates inside of STO around the development of the concept of white skin privilege, which was one of the sort of key conceptual ideas that STO advanced over the course of its existence, um, and gives a flavor of how that concept came to be sort of concretized and how different versions came to be sort of uh, assessed and either accepted or rejected inside the group. Uh, and it's important to note the very first sentence uh, mentions a pamphlet that I won't otherwise talk about um, that was uh, another pamphlet STO produced in the early 70s called The United Front Against Imperialism? Question mark. Um, so just so you know that's what that is when I get to it right here in the first sentence. If the United Front Against Imperialism represented STO's official program in regard to white supremacy, Another document attempted to flesh out the subjective aspects of this program 
in the context of working class life. This document was a speech given by Noel Ignatin, now Noel Ignatiev, in 1972 to a group of student radicals in Portland, Oregon. Originally untitled and subsequently known as Black Worker, White Worker, the talk is peppered with real life examples of race relations in the steel mills and in other heavy industry settings. It takes these seemingly isolated vignettes and weaves them into a thoughtful examination of the complexities and contradictions of white supremacy and resistance to it in a working class context. Thus, for example, Ignatin describes a large farm equipment manufacturing plant in Chicago where, quote, a black worker was being tried out for a repair job on an assembly line. The foreman had been harassing the man, trying to disqualify him during his three-day trial period. After two days of this, the majority of workers on the line, black and white, walked off their jobs, demanding that the man be accepted for his job. The company backed down and work resumed. Later on, some of the same white workers took part in racist demonstrations at a Chicago high school. The demonstrations were called against overcrowding in an attempt to keep out several hundred black students who had been transferred to the school as a result of redistricting." End quote. Fully aware of the historical resonance, Ignatin characterizes this internal conflict as, quote, a civil war in the mind of the white worker, end quote. The two sides in this conflict are, on the one hand, quote, the drive to reorganize society so that they, the workers, become the masters of production instead of the servants of production, the essential meaning of socialism, end quote. And, on the other hand, the selfish pragmatism of the white skin privilege system. The task for white revolutionaries is to demonstrate to white workers the contradiction between these two worldviews and to encourage the embrace of the former and the rejection of the latter. In this context, quote, the daily activities of black people, especially the black workers, are the best existing model for the aspirations of workers generally as a distinct class of people, end quote. Thus, there is a direct correlation between resistance to white supremacy and the push toward working class self-emancipation because, quote, the activities of the black workers are the most advanced outpost of the new society we seek to establish. Indeed, white revolutionaries must understand and help the masses of white workers to understand that the interests of the entire working class can only be served by standing firmly with black workers, end quote. Ignatin's speech deliberately focuses on real-world examples where the perceived interests of workers, read white workers, conflict with the efforts of black people to improve their position in society. Only in situations like these can white workers be forced to make a decision between stark alternatives, fighting to defend the small gains that separate them from even more exploited black workers, or abandoning their own privileges in order to make common cause with black workers fighting for equality on the shop floor. Revolutionaries who accept this approach clearly have their work cut out for them. Ignatin readily agrees that this is not the most optimistic scenario. Quote, the course I advocate offers great difficulties, no doubt about it. It is likely that the repression directed against a radical group that relentlessly fought racial discrimination would be greater than that against a more moderate group. I freely concede all the difficulties. But then, he concludes reasonably enough, whoever said that making a revolution was easy, end quote. In the end, Ignatin's Portland speech represented a high point in STO's efforts to grapple with the contradictions and opportunities of life within a capitalist and white supremacist society. Today, the speech is one of the best known publications associated with STO, having been reprinted and widely distributed over the years by radical groups such as Anti-Racist Action. Nonetheless, its initial circulation inside STO prompted a contentious debate within the group around the version of white skin privilege analysis that it contained. Not long after the talk, talk was given, the text was proposed to STO's literature committee for distribution as, quote, a mass pamphlet that formalized our strategy for uh, the struggle against white supremacy, end quote. The committee unanimously rejected this proposal in a two-page document entitled Critique of Knowles' Portland Speech, and I should say that STO was famous for these scintillating, really grabby kind of titles. <laughs> Critique of Knowles' Portland Speech. <laughs> the committee argued both that, quote, the paper projects a moralistic and unprogrammatic approach to the fight against white supremacy, 
and that its conceptualization of socialism and how to win it is untenable in a document of a Leninist organization committed to a Leninist strategy for socialist revolution." End quote. The first argument, that the Portland speech was moralistic and unprogrammatic, was hardly a novel criticism. The author herself noted that much of the rest of the left characterized the STO overall position on white supremacy in exactly those terms. But for these claims to be made within the group itself represented a fundamental challenge. The critique argues that, quote, Noel fails to demonstrate the immediate interests whites have in fighting against the system of white skin privileges, end quote. In particular, Ignatin, quote, ignores the contradiction in these privileges. Not only do they divide the workers in struggle over immediate class issues, but they are often disadvantages disguised as privileges. Further, the line he puts forward is unprogrammatic. It requires white workers to make a commitment to socialism in order to repudiate their white skin privileges. Knoll presents no program based on repudiation of concrete privileges that the white worker can be won to in the daily battles of the class struggle." End quote. Thus, the critique was not, strictly speaking, a repudiation of the white skin privilege analysis, but rather an attempt to reformulate it so that it appealed to the perceived self-interests of white workers. In this sense, the critique could be perceived as an attempt to evade the difficulties encountered in attempting to win white workers to STO's politics and strategy. The very real examples of contradictory behavior by white workers offered in the Portland speech could not be resolved simply by showing the workers these contradictions. As Ignatin maintained, quote, white working people aren't stupid. They don't act in a racist fashion simply out of blind prejudice. There are much more substantial causes, the system of white skin privileges, which lead them to behave in a selfish, exclusionary manner, end quote. Facing this problem squarely did not make Ignatin's position moralistic, but it did demand that revolutionaries avoid easy answers. The second argument advanced in the critique that Ignatin's vision of socialism and the strategy for achieving it were unworkable also represented a fundamental challenge to STO's political outlook. In its view, Ignatin, quote, rejects Lenin's argument in what is to be done that by itself the experience of workers cannot produce socialist consciousness. To Lenin's approach, Noel counterposes the Gardner approach Discover the seeds of socialism in workers' self-activity. Identify them, nurture them. This approach is spontanist and syndicalist, end quote. In particular, the critique argues that Ignatin's Portland speech romanticized the revolutionary potential of the black community. Quote, he presents black culture as a model for the new society. He idealizes black consciousness and the social relations among black people. His program for fighting white supremacy is simply for whites to recognize black culture and the black movement as the best expression of socialism, end quote. The obvious alternative from the perspective of the literature committee was the embrace of the traditional Leninist approach, prioritizing the ideological intervention of revolutionary cadre such that, quote, the development of this revolutionary class consciousness is the job of conscious communists armed with Marxist-Leninist theory, end quote. The two criticisms, the romanticization of black culture and the rejection of the seeds of socialism analysis, must be distinguished, if for no other reason than that the former was insightful, while the latter was an unthinking regurgitation of Stalinist methodology. The projection of revolutionary potential onto the black community was indeed a problem that characterized STO throughout most of its existence, although it was by no means the only radical group of its era to make this mistake. Even Ignatiev himself now considers this to have been one of STO's main shortcomings, lamenting the fact that the group couldn't see the difference between black revolution and proletarian revolution. He draws a parallel to the early IWW's failure to see the difference between industrial unionism and revolution as such. The biggest culprit here was the context of the early 1970s, following upon two full decades during which every progressive movement in the United States had either emerged from or taken direct inspiration from the black community. In this context, it is easy to see how such romanticization could have developed, although the critique was certainly correct in challenging it. On the second question, however, concerning the seeds of socialism idea, Ignatin's Portland speech holds up 
four decades later. A significant part of what made STO unique politically within its milieu was precisely the rejection of traditional understandings of Leninist strategy. Nonetheless, a tension always existed within STO regarding the relative importance of Leninist party building measures and what the critique describes as the Gardner approach. The critics of Ignatian's Portland speech were hardly alone in wanting STO to develop into a Marxist-Leninist party. This objective, as has been noted previously, marked STO from its founding in late 1969. Indeed, by the mid-70s, STO would begin to place primary emphasis on this development, although as a group, it was always convinced that any such party would necessarily be led primarily by revolutionaries of color. In this context, a major factor, not just in STO, but within the entire North American left, was the prominence of Maoism and Stalinism within the black movement. From the League of Revolutionary Black Workers to the Black Panther Party, and from the Republic of New Africa to the African People's Socialist Party, black radicals, organizations of the early 1970s, almost invariably aligned themselves with the Maoist tradition within Marxism. Thus, Ignatian's conceptual interest in the Gardner approach was more than counterbalanced by the practical requirements of STO's efforts to combat white supremacy within the context of the new communist movement. The result, in terms of Ignatian's Portland speech, was a contradictory view of organization, one that placed a high value on both mass self-determination and Leninist cadre structures. STO's evolving perspective on this subject would oscillate over the next decade between party building and autonomy. The tension between these two poles was not to be easily resolved within STO. So that gives a little bit of a flavor, I think, of some of the, the intellectual and internal dynamics that operated at least at that point in time. Um, and I think some of you are probably aware that internal political debate was a hugely important aspect of STO's self-understanding uh, throughout its existence. Um, and that became even more pronounced as the 70s progressed and into the 1980s. But I wanted to give that as just sort of one example of how they went about that process. So the last reading is from the conclusion. For those of you who are familiar with uh, the work of the Marxist economist Harry Cleaver, who wrote a book called Reading Capital Politically, the conclusion is entitled Reading STO Politically. Connecting all of STO's diverse experiences was a sort of real-world revolutionary pragmatism that did not always track with its seemingly unshakable theoretical commitments. While this tension opened the door to criticisms of the group's practical work as needlessly eclectic, there are actually any number of themes that connect a wide range of activities undertaken over the better part of two decades. Most of these have less to do with theory than they do with revolutionary strategy. Questions of mass action and illegality, of internationalism and anti-imperialism, of anti-fascism, feminism, popular culture, and the central role of class struggle all present themselves when considering the contemporary value of STO. And I should say that the that a big part of the conclusion is uh, involves sort of addressing each of those in turn. The section I'm about to read addresses really only the first two, mass action and illegality. The group's long-standing emphasis on mass action and illegality was directly connected to the notion that proletarian consciousness emerges in the context of struggle and especially direct action. There was an almost mystical aspect to this analysis with more than a touch of Frantz Fanon's ecstatic embrace of the transformative qualities of revolutionary violence. For STO, however, the key was not necessarily violence, though the group always rejected pacifism, but rather the need to move beyond the confines of bourgeois legality. The mystical element was also related to a millenarian outlook that was perpetually anticipating the net possibly, hopefully, final upsurge, whether in the factories or emerging from within new social movements. Even during periods of low ebb, the group was convinced that mass struggles would return. It was only a question of when. On the one hand, this approach led many of the group's most enthusiastic members to burn out and leave in disillusionment when the hoped-for moment of upsurge continued to be put off. At the same time, it was precisely this constant attentiveness to new motion that allowed STO to engage at the earliest stages of multiple struggles. <clears throat> 
The trick for contemporary radicals, of course, is to balance these two aspects, to avoid burnout without missing the boat when mass movements emerge, as they so often do, <laughs> suddenly and in unexpected places. The revolutionary left's recent interaction with the Occupy movement presents a relevant case study. Some radicals immediately dismissed Occupy Wall Street as a liberal or populist manifestation of the sense of entitlement of bourgeois youth, while others latched on in order to aggressively push their specific organizational line. Still, there were some who quickly recognized the organic prospects for militant anti-capitalist organizing inherent in the movement. This latter tendency, including a number of organizations and individuals across the U.S. who drew direct inspiration from the legacy of STO, not to mention a few former members, successfully involved itself in some of the most exciting aspects of the Occupy phenomenon, such as the Oakland General Strike of October 2011. Considered more directly, the issue of illegality also has profound implications for revolutionary strategy. STO was highly aware of the ways in which public discussions of illegality were guaranteed to draw the attention of the repressive apparatus of both the state and of private capitalist entities. The group spent significant time researching and analyzing the contours of both forms of repression while scrupulously trying to avoid any direct entanglements with either one. One of the small handful of STO-related documents to have been recently republished is Ken Lawrence's pamphlet, The New State Repression, which challenged many common, then and still, left assumptions about police activity in the post-COINTELPRO era. Echoing STO's general analysis, Lawrence argued that the legalistic defense of constitutional protections and civil liberties, so common on the left since the 1960s, in fact undermined radical insurgencies instead of bolstering them. The same confusion around these issues that plagued the left in 1985 <clears throat> is ubiquitous today, and contemporary radical formations have much to learn from STO's attentiveness to illegality and repression. Another aspect here was the deliberate decision to prioritize mass and class <laughs> over party focusing on the decisive role masses of people would play in any revolutionary upsurge. This approach became more pronounced over time, basically in tandem with the group's growing attachment to the concept of autonomy. There is incredible value today in this set of insights, especially when compared to the still lingering legacy of what Max Elbaum has called the sect-building approach, which placed self-described vanguard parties at the center of all struggle. When contemporary movements like the Arab Spring or Occupy show the ability to emerge almost without warning, it is essential to have a framework that allows for a critical analysis of the shortcomings of such developments while still recognizing the central importance of the movements themselves. This was the approach taken, for instance, by a loose network of STO-inspired groups and individuals who participated actively in Occupy across the U.S. Critical reflections from a range of revolutionary perspectives were collected in the pamphlet Hella Occupy that was produced in December of 2011. One common manifestation of the support for mass action is the uncritical perspective that has sometimes been called movementism, essentially the belief that social movements are entirely self-directing and that there is no value or even negative value in attempting to critically intervene within them as conscious revolutionaries. This viewpoint is in large part of a result of a proper rejection of the sect-building model, but it bends the stick too far in the opposite direction. While STO consistently rejected this sort of approach and always emphasized the need to interact critically with any social struggle, it is not hard to see the line that leads from certain STO positions to movementism. The creation of what has been termed the nonprofit industrial complex has also been part of the problem to the extent that NGOs routinely impose limits on forms of struggle, and in particular, the demand for legality. Additionally, there is a deeper difficulty of attempting to develop revolutionary momentum in an era where mass movements of any sort are few and far between, the sudden rise of Occupy notwithstanding. This was partly the cause of the decline of STO itself, as the movements that emerged from the 60s receded and the organization became something of a fish out of water. Unfortunately, it is not clear that STO's strategic perspective on the importance of mass struggles provides any clear lessons that can solve this continuing problem 
STO was always better at creating a pole within already existing movements than it was at catalyzing new ones. What to make of STO in the final analysis? Noel Ignatiev once described the group to me as, quote, an organization of revolutionaries that tried to think, end quote. On one level, this may seem one-sided, insofar as it focuses on the thinking rather than the doing aspect of the process, but perhaps we should think of revolutionaries as those who actually attempt to make revolution, rather than simply those who profess its value in the abstract. Seen from this angle, the 70s left was peppered with organizations that tried to make revolutions, and it was the attempt to reflect critically on that process that made STO unusual. John Garvey, a close comrade of STO for many years, argues that in spite of many flaws, quote, STO remains the single most remarkable organization of its era, end quote. Hopefully this book, at the very least, has adequately demonstrated what made it remarkable, both for better and for worse. On the other hand, Mario Tronti, a veteran of the Italian autonomous Marxist current that so influenced STO, reflected on his own milieu by claiming that it produced, quote, many flowers, little fruit, end quote. This seems in some ways a helpful metaphor for understanding STO if we think of flowers as valuable insights and fruit as lasting practical outcomes. No matter how remarkable STO may have been, today's radicals are largely tasked with reinventing the wheel of revolutionary struggle, as have so many earlier generations. That's it. Uh, I'm happy to answer any questions, engage in dialogue, get people's perspectives. If I guess probably it might be easiest to begin if anybody has any clarifying questions, things they didn't quite get. I know that was a lot of material and a lot of it comes in the form of the book with previous explanatory notes or footnotes and that sort of thing. Yes? I would say a couple of significant aspects of Lenin's uh, program that you rejected, or the STO projects. Hmm. I would say the way that it was often phrased was that STO thought of itself as a group of state and revolution Leninists rather than what is to be done Leninists. And what really, I think, was the norm was not so much that they would articulate a specific set of critical of rejections of Leninist precepts as much as they would say, the rest of you all have it wrong. Lenin didn't actually believe X, Y, and Z. And if we, if we think that he did, he only believed it in 1902. And by 1917, he changed his mind. And that was sort of their, their sort of line of reasoning. Um, one of the things that I criticize a little bit in a different section of the conclusion is the uh, almost fetishistic attachment that STO felt to Leninism um, as, as it led them into these sorts of debates where they were, you know, it's the sort of predictable cycle of who can quote which obscure set of Lenin's writings. So I don't know if that answers your question, but I would say it wasn't so much that they thought they were rejecting anything inside Leninism as that they thought they were upholding some true Leninism against all the other deviations. Which I think was also a, a fairly common stance that was taken by almost every other group of that era in that milieu in the new communist movement and in, in other sort of segments of that. So, yes? Um, I have two questions. One is, did they actively seek to recruit people? Um, and if so, how? And secondly, um, in other words, did they, were they, did they see themselves as, as building a party? Um, and secondly, um, what kind of process did they use for decision making, like consensus or democratic centralism, et cetera? Um, in terms of the first, uh, STO from the very start thought of itself as a sort of pre-party formation. Um, but again, always believed that the party was necessarily, if it was going to reflect the class, would have to be emerging from the coming together of multiple organizations, especially what it saw as sort of um, leading revolutionary nationalist organizations of overwhelmingly made up of people of color. Uh, so in that sense, it had this kind of ambivalent response to the idea of recruitment. It wanted to self-perpetuate. It wanted to keep growing. It felt that it had important things to say. But at the same time, uh, it was always sort of shy about 
um, trying to get uh, new people to sort of buy the line for a couple of reasons. One, a big one is that that was uh, sort of a stumbling block to their vision of, of what autonomy meant. So at, at different points, this was more accentuated than at others, but a lot of the time, STO felt like autonomy needed to be autonomy not only from bad guys, but also from the self-proclaimed good guys. And that included not only labor unions and sort of self-declared vanguard parties, but also you know groups like STO that thought they knew what was best, and maybe they were wrong. Um, so autonomy created this conflict inside the group, and that's one of the sort of arguments that I draw throughout the book, um, that I think limited the group's ability to recruit, and it's in fact its desire to recruit. Um, in terms of decision making, uh, the group never used any sort of consensus model as far as I'm aware. It always identified itself with a sort of majoritarian system. Uh, it was very fond of drawing lines of division, mm -hmm. creating debate that could draw out differences, and then through that process come to forms of agreement uh, on the basis of majority rule. Um, there is a part in the book where I describe the same way, as I mentioned earlier, about sort of general proposition of defending what it thought was true Leninism, uh, an engagement where it defended what it thought was the true meaning of democratic centralism um, against people who had a much more traditional, um, fairly standard vision of democratic centralism that we might associate today. Uh, at the same time, that, that changed over time, I would say, and by the early 1980s, um, there were a lot of a lot of other things at play, and I would say it probably doesn't make sense to describe the group as being democratic centralist in any way after a certain period of time. There were a number of people who I did interviews with who said they would have never described the group in that way, um, but it's pretty clear from a number of documents, at least as late as the mid to late 70s, that that was a, a key part of its self-understanding. Yeah. I guess still uh, clarifying questions, just kind of demographics. I was wondering if you could give us a, a sense of the the numbers and, uh, that were involved in this uh, organization at different times, and if, if you could offer a little thoughts or observations uh, on the demographics of that, of course, including you know the, the you know, issues of race and gender, but also uh, issues of students, I mean, university people, who, you know, people who had been from the kind of SDS conjuncture, you know, kind of Vietnam era versus other what events, if there were. You know, if you could describe to some extent the kind of waves, um, you know, if there were moments of where there was more recruitment or more people attracted to the organization. And then a second question would be, I'm really interested in this uh, communist autonomy uh, contradiction. Um, and I wondered if you could, if uh, when you think about that in STO, are there particular individuals or parts of the country that, that you tended maybe towards one side of that, that uh, you know that mm -hmm. dynamic, that that contradiction, yeah. than the other, if you will, uh, more towards the you know the autonomy, more towards the communist, just things I could read to follow up to kind sure. of get a sense of this this, this debate as it as it played out. Sure. Uh, in terms of demographics, the group was always small. That's I think it's sort of over overwhelming demographic reality was that it was tiny. Uh, uh, you know I feel slightly guilty having written a book about a group that probably I think never had more than. 90 members probably at any given time, um, when there are much larger groups that don't have their own books. But I think it wasn't about size, it was about the, the value of what the group contributed. Uh, it was overwhelmingly white throughout its existence, um, exclusively white at different points in time. Um, interestingly, at its founding, um, there were a couple of members of color and, uh, and there was a vision there early on of STO as a multiracial organization, and that's part of what led to the choice of the name Sojourner Truth um, for the, the, the name of the organization. Um, uh, probably it was never, I don't think it was ever like 50-50 men, women, but maybe 60-40 men, women, something like that. Not as bad a gender ratio as a lot of groups that I've seen in my own personal experience. Um, and that carried through to leadership levels pretty consistently, although the group never had any sort of quota system for, um, for women in leadership. Uh, it was 
an interesting mix of people who had varying levels of university background. Um, and one thing that's sort of notable about it that I mentioned at one point is that uh, there was a sort of constant presence of what people called the heavies, who were the kind of intellectual leading lights of the organization who often formed a sort of informal hierarchy. Um, those people tended to have substantially less formal education than a sort of second layer of, um, of intellectually engaged members who often tended to be from professional backgrounds. As I said in the first section, there were a number of lawyers who were members at different points. Uh, at the same time, there were a number of people who you know, dropped out of school at varying points in time to get jobs in the factories and stuck with that. Some of them went back to school or back to academic posts after deindustrialization and burnout stripped them of that, um, that sort of line of work. Uh, so I think that's sort of, oh, I, mean, I guess in terms of age, it was you know, generally relatively young. There was certainly a sort of core, including that group of heavies that aged with the group. Um, and then it was sort of perpetually, you know, regenerated with younger members. Um, and I'd say in terms of uh, your second question around questions of communism autonomy and how that played out, one thing that I think was a pattern um, is that the uh, older, not necessarily older, older, but more long established members in a lot of cases tended to opt for communism, tended to opt for let's advance a specific line, we spent a lot of time developing it, um, and that included some of the, the heavies who helped develop that line in the first place. Um, whereas a lot of the younger members, especially in the later 70s and into the 80s, um, emerged or sort of came out of broadly anti-authoritarian um, social movements and perhaps had some exposure to anarchism or to other kind of visions of opposition to things like democratic centralism, those people tended to opt for autonomy as a, as a mode of engagement. Um, but I wouldn't draw too fine a point on that, and I think it varied often from issue to issue who was on which sides, which is something that I think was notable about the group in general, was that it, it was, there were a, a number of periods where factions developed and splits occurred, but on the whole, it was not an organization where there were sort of repetitive uh, sides that were always populated the same way. Um, there were sort of repeated conflicts, but they'd be populated, you know, same people would be on different sides at different points. So, um, so I, I hope that answers to some extent questions. Uh, I just have a, I'm sorry. Uh, I just have a question about maybe the, um, the kind of theoretical development of your research as it relates to something like Occupy and Arab Spring and whatnot. I mean, had you finished the research before, before these events? And so, you know, did, did, um, was there a kind of dialectical relationship between what was happening? Did, were, did things change in the book after you saw this? Or? The conclusion changed substantially, um, I would say. Uh, less because of the Arab Spring and more because of Occupy. Um, I finished the first version of the complete manuscript a year ago, right around now. And um, and I remember people asking me, the publisher, AK would ask me, you know, let's talk about what you think your target audience is. And I would say vague things like, oh, you know, younger people engaged in real struggles that are sort of curious about some of their history and trying to develop a more theoretical comprehension. I don't really know who those people are, but I know they're out there. And, um, <laughs> You know, by October, it was very clear who those people were in in a, in a big swath of the country. I mean, I think there are other people who fit that model that had nothing to do with Occupy. But, um, but so no, that was something that that profoundly changed how the conclusion was structured. Um, I I began doing the research in 2005, um, and at that point, I think there was really not very much interest in general in the kind of milieu that STO is part of, much less in STO itself. Um, and so it's been interesting to watch as the visibility of a group like STO has gotten greater and greater um, as I've gone further along in this research. And I don't think I had anything to do with that, really, because most people didn't know that I was working on this project. Um, but it's been gratifying to see that there is, I think, over time, an, an, a level of interest that has happened that way. Um,
that said, in terms of like how something like Occupy changed my vision of the bulk of the research or the book, I'm not sure that it changed much of anything. In some ways, I'd say it reconfirmed certain suspicions that I had developed about um, STO's analysis and that sort of thing. But I don't know that other than the conclusion where I was really deliberately trying to bring things up to the present day, I wouldn't say that too much else was sort of, you know, shattered by the rise of Occupy, if that makes sense. Yes? Yeah, you mentioned a few things that I want to, you know, more or less uh, make a couple of comments. In terms of, like, the, as you, you mentioned about the spontaneous uh, revealings mm -hmm. that, uh, you know, sometimes uh, people think that, uh, you know, with some sort of direction, but not erupt. Mm -hmm. There is a problem with that also. These uh, eruptions such as uh, what you mentioned, the Iron Sprint, mm -hmm. it only replaces, uh, you know, dictatorship of a capitalist system sure. with, uh, you know, not uh, still so much uh, democratic within bourgeois politics. And actually, you know, we have to study uh, history even more deeper because, I mean, this Occupy and the Iron Sprint movements and not even close to what the Paris Commune was. Sure. You know, that was the first uh, communist revolution in the world, and uh, you know, had uh, workers, uh, workers militias, and so on, and were really a big challenge to uh, you know the capitalist system, such as uh, the uh, May '68 in, in France. You know, that was a really uh, revolutionary situation, and. Uh, it comes always the question, you know, is it, it also how do you change things if there is not a, a program about, you know, what are we going to do? I mean, uh, how are we going to deal with the state? Uh, you know, you got the issues of the uh, productive areas, like the factories and so on. How do you occupy this, you know, and transform it, you know, uh, without or with, with how a, 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 a leadership? You know, elected by the workers itself, but it's still some sort of a leadership and a, you know, a vision where it is that uh, we have to go. You know, so so it, I think it's a, you know the a spontaneous element. If it is not combined with some sort of a perspective and organization, we have seen the failures that uh, history has shown us. Uh, that that's one I, you know point that I, I want to you know throw into the discussion. Uh, the only thing, the, the uh, another thing that I have noticed as uh, an activist uh, in the United States is one, and uh, I can make the criticism from one good example you made at the beginning. You know the labor bureaucracy. You know mm. the labor bureaucracy as an agent of counter revolution. All the organizations that I've seen in the United States, although more or less uh, they say, you know, when you confront them with the role that the labor bureaucracy uh, plays, they say, yeah, they accept the, 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 the argument. But in, the, in practice, they don't waive a significant, you know, an important fight against the labor bureaucracy. Because as, you know, it's needed that it is uh, within this framework of capitalism, it's good that uh, we organize ourselves in organizations and you know the trade unions are one of the few organizations that the working the workers have to you know more or less discuss uh, things to advance a uh, certain uh, benefits etc but at the same time they operate within the framework of capitalism and Lenin <laughs> observe you know uh, not idealizing Lenin or you know making a you know God of it, but he makes some good observations in imperialism mm -hmm. that the trade union bureaucracy defends the foreign policy of imperialism. You know, and uh, Latin America is the main example of uh, you know the FLCIA playing a, a big role in the foreign policy of the United States, and you know so is uh, the European trade union movement, etc. So it's the need, you know, while you defend the trade union versus the capitalists, it's also the need to wave a fight as you are fighting the, the capitalists also against the trade union bureaucrats. Because they, they see themselves not as, a fight, as fighters for a social change and replacement of the capitalist system. They see themselves as managers of the working class, you know. So, uh, and, and another, I'm sorry if I can continue for a couple of things. There's one military slogan, you know, 
as you know, one military uh, lesson that is taught in probably every military academy in the world that is uh, wherever you retreat, your enemy will advance. Or whenever you are not acting, probably some sort of a uh, not trustly ally will, will cover that, that, that spot. And one of the things that uh, you, know, you mentioned is about autonomy. You know, uh, that could be a subject of interpretation, but certainly in the black, uh, Chicano, Puerto Rican communities, there's like a two-tier problem. Not, o not only uh, people of what some people call people of color face oppression within the workplace, discrimination and, and some of these things. Also in the place that they reside, constantly confront the aspects of military repression by the, you know, paramilitary repression by the police, you know, lack of resources, uh, you know, from housing issues, etc. And uh, some, some sectors of the American left, as for example, have called populism, when you more or less, uh, you know, try to uh, do some work in that regard, which is parallel. You can fight against capitalism while defend, you know, uh, the, you know your your safety, you know your uh, dignity to reside in a, in, a, in a place or you know enjoy you know a, a safe uh, living. So uh, to this day, it's a problem. You know that the so-called left, uh, you know, don't, don't, is not able to wave a link, you know, to, to to these communities, and that's why you know, as for example. People complain, oh, the Black Panthers were authoritative, uh, you know, they were populist, they were much, whatever we want to say, but certainly they did play a role that, uh, you know, the so-called, you know, uh, uh, Leninists, uh, the pure Marxists uh, didn't, didn't, weren't able to, to, to play, you know, the, the, the Mexican, uh, the Brown Berets, the Puerto Rican young lords, the BSP, and the, you know, uh, the Black Panthers, with all their problems, which uh, these organizations are, uh, you know, certainly were probably not the best example of uh, leadership. Well, not probably. I would categorically say we're not the best example of leadership. Neither, not necessarily they had a, the, you know, a good program, but certainly they came and appeared there and had the, the biggest amount of uh, people of color militants because of a, a backing, you know. Uh, another, but. Uh, you know, uh, uh, the last uh, comment I want to make, I don't want to continue going on and on uh, with this, is that uh, certainly uh, the American left faces a problem in terms of solidarity. Sometimes uh, people romanticize so much uh, movements uh, in the third world where they are, always co they are also contradictions, there are problems from race, like the indigenous uh, people, uh, you know, it's not mm -hmm. easy to make a link in Latin America between the urban left and, you know, mm -hmm. people from the indigenous groups, etc. And sometimes in this country, you know, radicals, leftists, and communists, they have focused so much in instances in solidarity, in the abstract with the third world, that they haven't, you know, sometimes don't pay attention to the poor American world. Mm -hmm. You know, and that, yep. that's something yep. that should be, you know, more or less addressed, yep. and, you know, better. So I, I leave it for now. Right there. Okay. And that's, that's a lot, I guess, to try and get some brief sort of response. The, the first thing that you raised, I think, is mm, not too far off from how STO would have seen the, the question in terms of how do you strike the balance between the role of conscious revolutionaries and the role of of mass struggles as they emerge. Um, I think that the difficult part is how do you answer that question? Because that's, that's a question that almost any intelligent revolutionary is going to cop against at some point. Um, and you know, I think you can you can see a range of answers. Um, and hopefully, my book attempts to document one sort of set of, of answers to that, as as outlined by STO. Uh, the second one on, on labor unions. Um, I think STO always consistently took uh, in a harder, more critical position on labor unions than the one that you're uh, articulating, even though you're, you're clearly talking about labor bureaucrats and, and sort of being sort of man co-managers with, uh, with capitalism. Um, but STO, uh, and this is something I talk about extensively in, in the book, uh, 
um, consistently rejected any opportunity that was presented to it when it was organizing in factories to organize within um, union structures. Uh, and, and that was a, a source of some conflict early on in the group, but, um, but was something that was pretty consistently uh, a mark of its, of its work. Um, the third one in terms of uh, sort of militarization and repression in communities of color and the, the, therefore the, the correlating vibrancy of, of sort of potentially more populist formations, things like the Panthers, that sort of stuff. Uh, I think that was stuff that, that SGO sort of in its initial conception saw itself responding to. Um, there were actually veterans of both the Panthers and the Young Lords who were part of founding STO at the very beginning, um, although neither of those two people stuck around very long. Um, but the, uh, you know, again, I think it resolves to that same question of what's the, what's the interplay between um, revolutionaries and, and, and mass movements, and I think that the Panthers provided a particular sort of model for how to answer that question um, that I think ran into massive repression but also carried an enormous number of internal contradictions. Um, SCO didn't see nearly as much repression but had a different set of internal contradictions. Um, and finally on the, the sort of solidarity versus kind of domestic class questions, that's something that I, I've thought a lot about as I've done this research. Um, and I think one thing that's really interesting to me about STO is that it attempted to deal with both sides of that dynamic at, at, in different ways at different points. So, um, you know, I have a whole section of the book that talks about the workplace organizing that it did that was very much class-based, even though it also emphasized issues of white supremacy and white skin privilege in a class organizing context. And then at a later era, STO spent an enormous amount of effort involving itself in anti-imperialist solidarity efforts. So it saw both sides of that dynamic as well, um, whether either aspect of that in terms of sort of the practical work that STO undertook was, you know, productive in the long run is I think a, still an open question and one that I try to address. So. Yeah, so it's funny, I, I was a history major and I studied revolutions, but I've kind of left that world. Um, got into a lot more spiritual way mm -hmm. of shifting um, dynamic and change and, and energy on the planet. Um, and so it's really interesting hearing a lot of this stuff again and 